The Will of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall Read by J.R. Chapter 6 Mrs. Bingham departed, unwarned and unmourning, and in her stead resigned Mademoiselle de Hort, a youthful French governess with a long, pleasant face that reminded Stephen of a horse. This equine resemblance was fortunate in one way. Stephen took to Mademoiselle de Hort at once, but it did not make for respectful obedience. On the contrary, Stephen felt very familiar, kindly familiar, and quite at her ease. She petted Mademoiselle de Hort. Mademoiselle de Hort was lonely and homesick, and it must be admitted that she liked being petted. Stephen would rush off to get her a cushion, or a footstool, or her a glass of milk at eleven. Comme elle est gentille, c'est drôle de petite fine. Elle a si bon coeur. Would think Mademoiselle de Hort, and somehow geography would not seem to matter quite so much, or arithmetic either. In vain did Mademoiselle try to be strict. Her pupil could always beguile her. Mademoiselle de Hort knew nothing about horses, in spite of the fact that she looked so much like one, and Stephen would complacently entertain her with long conversations, and then splint and spaves, cow hooks and colic, all mixed up together in a kind of wild veterinarian jumble. Had William been listening, he might as well have rubbed his chin, but William was not there to listen. As for Mademoiselle de Hort, she was generally impressed. Mais quel type, quel type! She was always exclaiming, Vous êtes déjà une vraie petite Amazon, Stephen, n'est-ce pas? Agreed Stephen, who was picking up French. The child showed real ability for French, and this delighted her teacher. At the end of six months, she could gabble quite freely, making quick little gestures and shrugging her shoulders. She liked talking French. It rather amused her, nor was she adverse to mastering the grammar. What she could not endure were the long, foolish dictees from the edifying Bibliothèque Garros. Weak in all other respects with Stephen, Mademoiselle de Hort clung to these dictees, the bibliothèque rose became her last trench of authority, and she held it. Le petit fil modèle. Mademoiselle would announce, while Stephen yawned out her inevitable boredom. Maintenant, nous allons retrouver Sophie. Where did we arrive? Uh, oui, I remember. Ce père de confiance toucha Sophie et en même temps encore son regret d'avoir été si méchante. Comment se dit-elle, euh, j'ai pu me relivrer une telle colère Comment j'étais si méchante avec des amis aussi bons que celle que j'ai dit Et si radis en voir une personne aussi douce, aussi tendre que moi, moi celle de Fleurvire From time to time, the program would be varied by extracts of an even more edifying nature. And Les bons enfants would be chosen for dictation to the scorn and derision of Stephen. La maman, donne-lui ton cœur, mon Henri, c'est ce que tu pourras lui donner de plus agréable. Mon cœur, dit Henri, en déboutonnant son avit et en ouvrant sa chemise. Mais comment faire? Il me fraudait un coteau. At which Stephen would giggle. One day she had added a comment of her own in the margin. Little beastie, he was only shamming. And Mademoiselle, coming on this unawares, had been caught in the act of laughing by her pupil, after which there was naturally less discipline than ever in the schoolroom, but considerably more friendship. However, Anna seemed quite content, since Stephen was becoming so proficient in French, and observing that his wife looked less anxious these days, Sir Philip said nothing, biding his time. This frank haunty, slacking on the part of his daughter, should be checked later on, he decided. Meanwhile, Stephen grew fond of the mild-faced Frenchwoman, who in her turn adored the unusual child. She would confide her troubles to Stephen, those family troubles in which governess abound. Her mamma was old and delicate and needy, her sister had a wicked and spendthrift husband, and now her sister must make little bags for the grand shop in Paris that paid very badly. Her sister was gradually losing her eyesight from making those little 
bead bags for the shops that cared nothing and paid very badly. Mademoiselle sent Mamma a part of her earnings, and sometimes, of course, she must help her sister. Her Mamma must have her chicken, and on Sundays... Bon dieu, il faut rire, il faut manger, au moins... And afterwards, that chicken came in very nicely for pâté, my mite, which was made from its carcass, and a few leaves of cabbage. Mamma loved pâté, my mite. The warmth of it eased her old gums. Stephen would listen to these long dissertations with patience and apparent understanding. She would nod her head wisely. Mais c'est dur, she would comment. C'est terriblement dur, la vie. But she never confided her own special troubles, and Mademoiselle de Hort sometimes would wonder about her. Et elle est rose, c'est étrange, petit être. She would wonder. Sera-t-elle rose plus tard? Qui sait? Idleness and peace had reigned in the schoolroom for more than two years when ex Sergeant Smiley sailed over the horizon and proceeded to announce that he taught gymnastics and fencing. From that moment, peace ceased to reign in the schoolroom, or indeed anywhere in the house, for that matter. In vain did Mademoiselle protest that gymnastics and fencing thickened the ankles. In vain did Anna express disapproval. Stephen merely ignored them and consulted her father. I want to go in for sand doing, she informed him, as though they were discussing a career. He laughed. Sand doing? Well, and how will you start it? Then Stephen explained about ex Sergeant Smiley. I see, nodded Sir Philip. You want to learn fencing, and how to lift weights with my stomach, she said quickly. Why not your large front teeth? he teased her. Oh well, he added, there's no harm in fencing or gymnastics either, provided, of course, that you don't try to wreck Moulton Hall like a Samson wrecking the house of the Philistines. I foresee that might easily happen, Stephen grinned. But it mightn't if I cut off my hair. May I cut off my hair? Oh, do let me, father. Certainly not. I prefer to risk it, said Sir Philip, speaking quite firmly. Stephen went pounding back to the schoolroom. I'm going to those classes, she announced in triumph. I'm going to be driven over to Martha next week. I'm going to begin on Tuesday, and I'm going to learn fencing so I can kill your brother-in-law, who's a beast to your sister. I'm going to fight jewels for wives in distress, like men do in Paris. I'm going to learn how to lift pianos on my stomach by expanding something, the pan muscle, and I'm going to cut my hair off, she mendaciously concluded glancing sideways to observe the effect of this bombshell. Bon dieu, soyez clément, breathed Mademoiselle de Hort, casting her eyes to heaven. It was not very long before ex-Sergeant Smiley discovered that in Stephen he had a star pupil. Some day you ought to make a champion fencer, if you work really hard at it, miss, he told her. Stephen didn't learn to lift pianos with her stomach. But as time went on, she did become quite an expert gymnast and fencer, and as Mademoiselle de Hort confided to Anna, it was, after all, very charming to watch her, so supple and young and quick in her movements. And she fences like an angel, said Mademoiselle fondly. She fences now almost as well as she rides. Anna nodded. She herself had seen Stephen fencing many times, and had thought it a fine performance for so young a child but the fencing displeased her, so that she found it hard to praise Stephen. I hate all that sort of thing for girls, she said slowly. She fences like a man with such power and grace, babbled Mademoiselle de Hort, the tactless. And now life was full of new interests for Stephen, an interest that centered entirely in her body. She discovered her body for a thing to be cherished, a thing of real value since its strength could rejoice her, and young though she was, she cared for her body with a great diligence, bathing it night and morning in dull, tepid water. Cold baths were forbidden, and hot baths, she had heard, sometimes weakened the muscles. 
For gymnastics, she wore her hair in a pigtail, and somehow that pigtail began to intrude on other occasions. In spite of protests, she always forgot and came down to breakfast with a neat, shining plait, so that Anna gave in in the end and said, sighing, Have you pigtail too, child, if you feel you must? But I cannot say it suits you, Stephen. And Mademoiselle de Hort was foolishly loving. Stephen would stop in the middle of lesson to roll back her sleeves and examine her muscles. Then Mademoiselle de Hort, instead of protesting, would laugh and admire her absurd little biceps. Stephen's craze for physical culture increased, and now it began to invade the schoolroom. Dumbbells appeared in the schoolroom's bookcase, while half-worn-out gym shoes skulked in the corners. Everything went by the board but this passion of the child's for training her body, and what must Sir Philip elect to do next but to ride out to Ireland and purchase a hunter for his daughter to ride, a real thoroughbred hunter. And what must he say but, that one's for young Roger, so that Stephen found herself comfortably laughing at the thought of young Roger, and that laughter had went a long way towards healing the wound that had rankled within her. Perhaps this is why Sir Philip had ridden out to Ireland for that thoroughbred hunter. The hunter, when he came, was grey-coated and slender, and his eyes were as soft as an Irish morning, and his courage was as bright as an Irish sunrise, and his heart was as young as the wild heart of Ireland but devoted and loyal and eager to serve, and his name was sweet on the tongue as you spoke it, being Raftery after the poet. Stephen loved Raftery, and Raftery loved Stephen. It was love at first sight, and they would talk to each other for hours in the loose box, not in Irish or English, but in a quiet language, having very few words but many small sounds and many small movements, which in both of them meant more than words. And Raftery said, I will carry you bravely, I will serve you all the days of my life. And she would answer, I will care for you night and day, Raftery, all the days of my life. Thus Stephen and Raftery pledged their devotion, alone in the fragrant hay-scented stable. And Raftery was five, and Stephen was twelve when they solemnly pledged their devotion. Never was a rider more proud or more happy than Stephen, when first she and Rafty went a hunting, and never was a youngster more wise or courageous than Rafty proved himself at the fences, and never can a Belfon have thrilled to more daring than did Stephen, astride of Rafty that day, with the wind in her face and the fire in her heart that made life a thing of glory. At the beginning of the run, the fox turned in the direction of Morton, actually crossing the big north paddock before turning once more and making for Upton. In the paddock was a mighty upstanding hedge, a forbidable place concealing timber. And what must they do, these two young creatures, but go straight at it and get safely over? Those who saw Raftiel fly the hedge could never afterwards doubt his valour. And when they got home, there was Anna waiting to pat Rafty, because she could not resist him. Because, being Irish, her hands loved the feel of fine horse flesh under their delicate fingers, and because she did very much want to be tender to Stephen, and understanding. But as Stephen dismounted, bespettled and dishevelled, and yet with that peevish look of her father, the words that Anna had been planning to speak died away before they could get themselves spoken. She shrank back from the child, but the child was too overjoyed at the moment to perceive it. Happy days, splendid days of childish achievements, but they passed all too soon, giving place to the season, and there came the winter when Stephen was fourteen. On a January afternoon of bright sunshine, Mademoiselle de Hort sat dabbing her eyes, for Mademoiselle de Hort must leave her love Stephen must give place to a rival who could teach Greek and Latin. She would go back to Paris, the poor Mademoiselle de Hort, and take care of her aging mamma. Meanwhile, Stephen, very angular and lanky at fourteen, was standing before her father in the study. She stood still, but her glance kept straying to the window, 
to the sunshine that seemed to be beckoning through the window. She was dressed for riding in breeches and garters, and her thoughts were with Raphael. Sit down, said Sir Philip, and his voice was so grave that her thoughts came back with a leap and a bound. You and I have got to talk this thing out, Stephen. What thing, father? She faltered, sitting down abruptly. You're right on this, my child. The time has now come when all play and no work will make a dull Stephen, unless we all pull ourselves together. She rested her large, shapely hands on her knees and bent forward, searching his face intently. What she saw there was a quiet determination that spread from his lips to his eyes. She grew suddenly uneasy, like a youngster who objected to the rather unpleasant process of mouthing. I speak French, she broke out. I speak French like a native. I can read and write French as well as Mademoiselle does. And beyond that, you know very little, he informed her. It's not enough, Stephen, believe me. There ensued a long silence, she tapping her leg with her whip, he speculating about her. Then he said, but quite gently, I've considered this thing. I've considered this matter of your education. I want you to have the same education, the same advantages as I'd give to my son. That is as far as possible, he added, looking away from Stephen. But I'm not your son, father, she said very slowly, and even as she said it, her heart felt heavy, heavy and sad, as it had not done for years, not since she was quite a small child. And at this he looked back at her, with love in his eyes, love and something that seemed like compassion. And their looks met and mingled and held for a moment, speechless, yet somehow expressing their hearts. Her own eyes clouded and she stared at her boots, ashamed of the tears that she felt might flow over. He saw this and went on speaking more quickly, as though anxious to cover her confusion. You're all the son I've got, he told her. You're brave and strong-limbed, but I want you to be wise. I want you to be wise for your own sake, Stephen, because at the best, life requires great wisdom. I want you to learn to make friends of your books. Some day you may need them, because... He hesitated. Because you may to find life at all easy. We, none of us do, and books are good friends. I don't want you to give up your fencing and gymnastics or riding, but I want you to show moderation. You've developed your body, now develop your mind. Let your mind and your muscles help, not hinder each other. It can be done, Stephen. I've done it myself, and in many respects you're like me. I've brought you up very different from most girls. You must know that. Look at Violet Adrian. I've indulged you, I suppose, but I don't think I've spoiled you, because I believe in you absolutely. I believe in myself too. Where you are concerned, I believe in my own sound judgment. But you have now got to prove that my judgment has been sound. We have both got to prove it to ourselves and to your mother. She's been very patient with my unusual methods. I'm going to stand trial now, and she'll be my judge. Help me. I'm going to need all the help. If you fail and I fail, we shall go down together, but we are not going to fail. You are going to work harder when your new governess comes, and when you're older, you are going to become a fine woman. You must, dear. I love you so much that you can't disappoint me. His voice faltered a little when he held out his hand. And Stephen, come here. Look me straight in the eye. What is honor, my daughter? She looked into his anxious, questioning eyes. You are honor, she said quite simply. When Stephen kissed Mademoiselle de Hort goodbye, she cried, for she felt that something was going that would never come back. Irresponsible childhood. It was going like Mademoiselle de Hort, kind Mademoiselle de Hort, so foolishly loving, so easily coerced, so glad to be persuaded, so eager to believe that you were doing your best in the face of the most obvious slacking. Kind Mademoiselle de Hort, who smiled when she shouldn't, who laughed when she shouldn't, and who was weeping, 
but weeping as only a Latin can weep, shedding rivers of tears and sobbing quite loudly. Cherie, mon bébé, petit chou. She was sobbing as she clung to the angular Stephen. The tears ran down on Mademoiselle's tippet, and they wet the poor fur, which already looked jagged, and the fur clung together, turning black with those tears, so that Mademoiselle tried to wipe it. But the more she wiped it, the wetter it grew, since her handkerchief only augmented the trouble, nor was Stephen's large handkerchief very dry either, as she found when she started to help. The old station fly that had come out from Malvern drove up, and the footman seized Mademoiselle's luggage. It was such meagre luggage that he waved back the assistance from the driver, and lifted the trunk single-handed. Then Mademoiselle de Hort broke out into English, heaven only knew why, perhaps from emotion. It's not farewell. It shall not be forever, she sobbed. You come, but I feel it, to Paris. We meet once more, Stephen. My poor little baby, when you grow up big, we two meet once more. And Stephen, already taller than she was, longed to grow small again, just to please Mademoiselle. Then, because the French are a particular pupil, even in moments of real emotion, Mademoiselle found her handbag and groped in its depths. She produced a half sheet of paper. The address of my sister in Paris, she said, sniffing. The address of my sister who makes little bags. If she should hear of anyone, Stephen, any lady who would care to buy one little bag. Yes, yes, I'll remember, mumbled Stephen. At last she was gone, the fly rumbling down the drive and finally turning the corner. To the end, a wet face had been thrust from the window. A wet handkerchief waved despondently at Stephen. The rain must have mingled with Mademoiselle's tears, for the weather had broken and now it was raining. It was surely a desolate day for departure, with the mist closing over the Severn Valley and beginning to creep up the hillside. Stephen made her way to the empty schoolroom, empty of all save a general confusion, the confusion that stalked in some people's trail. It had always stalked Mademoiselle de Horde. On the chairs, which stood crooked, lay odds and ends meaning nothing, crumpled paper, a broken shoehorn, a well-worn brown glove that had lost its fellow, and likewise two buttons. On the table a much abused blotting paper, from which Stephen had torn off the corner, unhidden. It was crossed and recrossed with elegant French script until its scarred face had turned purple. And there stood the bottle of purple ink, half empty and green round the neck with drips, and a pen with a nip as sharp as a pin point, a thin peevish nib that jabbed at the paper. Chock a block with the bottle of purple ink lay a little piety card of Saint Joseph that had evidently slipped out of Mademoiselle's miselle. Saint Joseph looked very respectable and kind, like a fishmonger in Great Marvin. Stephen picked up the card and stared at Saint Joseph. Something was written across his corner. Looking closer, she read the minute handwriting. Priez pour ma petite Stephen. She put the card away in her desk. The ink in the bottle she hid in the cupboard together with the peevish still nib that jarred paper and that richly deserved cremation. Then she straightened the chairs and threw away the litter. After which she went in search of her duster. One by one she dusted the few remaining volumes in the bookshelf including the Bibliotheca Rose. She arranged her dictation notes in a pile with others that were far less accurately written. Books of sums mostly careless and marked with the cross, books in English history, in one of which Stephen had begun to write the history of the horse. Books of geography with Mademoiselle's comments in this strong purple ink, and lastly she collected the torn lesson books that had laid on their backs on their sides, on in their bellies, anyhow, anywhere, in drawers or in cupboards, but not very often in the bookcase. For the bookcase was harboring other things, a motley and mostly unstudious collection, wooden and iron of various sizes, some Indian clubs, one split off at the handle, cotton laces for gym shoes, the belt of a tunic, 
and then stable keepsakes, including a headband that Raphael had worn on several occasions, a miniature horseshoe kicked sky-high by Collins, a half-eaten carrot, now withered and mouldy, and two hunting crops that had both lost their lashes and were waiting to visit the saddler. Stephen considered, rubbing her chin, a habit which by now had become automatic. She finally decided on an ample box sofa as a seemly receptacle, remained only the carrot, and she stood for a long time with it clasped in her hand, disturbed and unhappy. This clearing of the desk for stern mental action was certainly very depressing, but at last she threw the thing in the fire, where it shifted distressfully, sizzling and humming. Then she sat down and stared rather grimly at the flames that were burning up Raphael's first carrot.